السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته To carry on with the upper limb lectures I'm gonna discuss in this presentation The anatomy of the joints of the upper limb I'm Dr. Dalia Saleh Professor and the head of anatomy department At Mansoura University, Egypt For the anatomy of the joints of the upper limb We should cover the following points we will talk about the types of the various joints, the articular surfaces of the bones sharing in the formation of these joints, the capsule that surrounds the joints, how it is attached and if there is something particular about it, the ligaments supporting these joints, either capsular or extracapsular ligaments, the description of the joint cavity and if it contains an articular disc, then the blood supply and nerve supply of these joints, the movements that take place at various joints and the factors keeping its stability. The joints of the upper limb include the pectoral girdle, which is formed of the sternoclavicular and acromioclavicular joints, the shoulder joint, the elbow joint, the radioulnar joints, which include the superior, middle, and the inferior joints. The wrist joint, the intercarpal joints, the carbometacarpal joints, the metacarbophalangeal joints, and the interphalangeal joints, which include proximal and distal joints. We start first with the pectoral girdle, and as I said, it is formed of two joints, the sternoclavicular and the chromoclavicular joints. The sternoclavicular joint is a synovial modified saddle joint and as you know the saddle joints uh, move in biaxial direction while the modified saddle it allows a little bit of rotation as well. The sternoclavicular joint is formed of the medial end of the clavicle that fits into the clavicular notch uh, on the monoprium sterni. It is surrounded by a capsule that is enforced by the anterior and posterior sternoclavicular ligaments. We also have the interclavicular ligament and the costoclavicular ligament between the undersurface of the medial end of the clavicle and the first strip. Inside the sternoclavicular joint, there is a fibrocartilaginous disc that divides the joint cavity into two compartments. And we need to remember that the costoclavicular ligament is the main factor that supports this joint. The acromioclavicular joint is a synovial plane joint, so it allows just gliding movement. It is formed by articulation of the lateral end of the clavicle with the, a facet on the medial border of the acromial process of the scapula. It is surrounded by a capsule and enforced by superior and inferior acromioclavicular ligaments. We also have the coracoclavicular ligament, which is the main factor that supports the weight of the upper limb and the scapula, and transmitting them to the clavicle, thus to the axial skeleton. So it is important to remember this ligament very well. It is attached from the coracoid process of the scapula to the undersurface of the lateral end of the Clavicle. It's formed of two parts, trapezoid part and conoid parts. For the movements of the pectoral girdle, we have muscles that lie uh, on the posterior aspect. We call them the posterior muscle, like the trapezius muscle here, and the rhomboids. Rhomboid is minor and major. And we also have the levator scapulae. The muscles that help in elevation of the shoulders include the upper fibers of the trapezius and the levator scapulae, while the muscles that help in retraction of the shoulder blades or the two scapulae together, we have the middle fibers of the trapezius and the rhomboides minor and major. While the anteriorly placed muscles, like the subclavius or pectoralis minor, they will help in depression of the pectoral girdle. They also help in protraction of the scapula or moving the scapula around the convexity of the ribs and this is performed by the pectoralis minor 
and also by the serratus anterior muscle. The shoulder joint is a synovial ball and socket joint. It is a polyaxial joint, so it allows a wide range of movement in all directions. It is formed by the articulation between the head of the humerus and the glenoid cavity of the scapula. Since the glenoid cavity is a shallow surface, it is deepened by the attachment of a cartilage around the rim of the glenoid surface. We call it the glenoid labrum. It deepens the cup shaped glenoid cavity to fit the head of the humerus inside it. This joint is surrounded by a thin and a lax capsule to allow its free mobility. It is attached around the rim of the glenoid cavity and also to the anatomical neck of the humerus. Supported by many ligaments like the glenohumeral ligament between the glenoid cavity and the humerus, the coracohumeral ligament between the coracoid process and the humerus, the transverse humeral ligament between the lesser and the greater tuberosities of the humerus and bridges the bicepital groove, the coracoacromial ligament between the acromial process and the coracoid process of the scapula. This ligament does not support the capsule of the shoulder joint, but it limits the unwanted upward movement of the head of the humerus. Also, there is a close proximity of the tendons of the rotator cuff muscles that insert at the upper end of the humerus. These tendons surround the shoulder joints from the anterior, superior, and posterior aspects, thus helps in its support and protection. So the most important factors you should remember here is the capsule of the shoulder joint that is lax and thin to allow free movement of the shoulder joint. And also the main factor that helps in its support is the tendons of the rotator cuff muscles. We divide the muscles of the shoulder joint into two groups. The muscles that are attached to the upper end of the humerus, we call them the rotator cuff muscles. They have only one action and pass either anterior to the head of the humerus like the subscapularis and thus causing medial rotation of the humerus or posterior to the humerus like the infraspinatus anterior minor and these two muscles will produce lateral rotation of the humerus or superior to the shoulder joint like the supraspinatus that initiates the abduction movement. So in this diagram we can see the shoulder joint. This is a lateral view of the shoulder joint. You can see the rotator cuff muscles in close proximity to the shoulder joint. Anteriorly we have the subscapularis superiorly the supraspinatus, posteriorly the infraspinatus and the teres minor muscles. The other group of muscles that originate from the axial skeleton and insert into the humerus and act on the shoulder joint, we have the anteriorly placed muscles. These muscles will cause flexion of the shoulder joint. We have the pectoralis major, the anterior fibers of the deltoid, and the coracobrachialis. While the posteriorly placed muscles that lie behind the shoulder joint will cause extension, we have the latissimus dorsi, the teres major, and the posterior fibers of deltoid. We also have the superiorly placed muscles that will cause abduction as the supraspinatus, I have already mentioned it before, and the middle fibers of deltoid muscle. The elbow joint is a synovial hinge joint, so it is a uniaxial joint. This joint is formed by articulation between three bones, the lower end of the humerus and the upper ends of both the radius and the ulna. At the lower end of the humerus, we have the capitulum and the trochlea. The capitulum will articulate with the superior surface of the head of the radius, while the trochlea will articulate with the trochlear notch of the ulna.
the elbow joint is surrounded by a capsule that is attached superiorly at the lower end of the humerus and also at the anterior surfaces of both the medial and the lateral epicondyles of the humerus and below it is attached to the borders of the coronoid process of the ulna and the annular ligament that holds the head of the radius into the radial notch of the ulna at the back it is also attached to the margins of the olecranon fossa and also below to the margins of the head of the radius and also to the olecranon process of the ulna it is supported by both lateral collateral ligaments and medial collateral ligament the blood supply of the elbow joint is derived from the anastomosis of the arteries around it both in front and behind the medial and the lateral epicondyles of the humerus it is important anastomosis that we need to remember it so we have here on the lateral side or at the lateral epicondyle of the humerus in front of it we have the radial collateral artery that is derived from the profunda brachii artery that anastomose with the recurrent radial artery at the back of the lateral epicondyle we have the middle collateral artery that descends from also from the profunda brachii artery and meets the interosseous recurrent artery that arises from the interosseous artery branch of the ulnar artery at the medial epicondyle in front of it we have the inferior ulnar collateral artery a branch from the brachial artery itself that anastomose with the anterior ulnar recurrent while posterior to the medial epicondyle we have the superior ulnar collateral branch of the brachial artery that anastomose with the posterior ulnar recurrent for the movements of the elbow joint we have either flexion performed by the biceps brachii brachialis and brachioradialis and extension performed by the triceps brachii and anconius muscle For the superior radio ulnar joint, it is a synovial pivot joint. Thus, it is a uniaxial joint that allows rotation. It is made by an axis that fits inside a ring. The axis here is made by the head of the radius, while the ring is made partially by the radial notch on the ulna, which is completed to form a ring by the annular ligament. This joint is contained within the capsule of the elbow joint and the most important factor we need to talk about it now is the annular ligament. So the annular ligament is a fibrous ligament that is attached to the margins of the radial notch of the ulna. Inside it fits the head of the radius. So the head of the radius is the axis that will rotate around its vertical axis inside this ring. The inferior radio ulnar joint, as we can see from this picture, which represents the inferior surface of both radius and the ulna. It is also a synovial pivot joint that allows rotatory movement. It is made by the articulation of the head of the ulna into the ulna notch at the lower end of the radius. It has a thin capsule that is supported by the palmar and the dorsal radio ulnar ligaments it is important to remember that there is a fibrocartilaginous articular disc that is attached by its apex to the styloid process of the ulna and to its base to the ulna notch on the radius and this fibrocartilage will hold the ulna and radius together and separates the inferior radio ulnar joint from the wrist joint for the movements of the radio ulnar joints, we have either supination, which is made by the biceps brachii during flexion of the elbow, the supinator muscle during extension of the elbow, and pronation is made by the pronator teres muscle and the pronator quadratus muscle. So, this is the position of the forearm during supination. 
and this is the position of the forearm during pronation. As we can see, the ulna is fixed while the radius is the one that rotates around its vertical axis. In the mid prone position, we have the brachioradialis muscle active. So, in this position, it initiates both pronation and supination and also can flex the elbow joint while it is in the mid prone position. The wrist joint is a synovial ellipsoid joint, which is a piaxial joint, allows flexion, extension, adduction, and abduction of the wrist. It is formed by articulation of uh, the lower ends of both radius and ulna, together with the bones forming the first row of the carpal bones. So we have the lower end of the radius will articulate with both scaphoid and leonate bones, while the lower end of the ulna will be separated by the fibrocartilaginous disc from the lunate bone and the triquetral bone. Again, the fibrocartilaginous disc, which is important here, it is triangular in shape, so its apex is attached to the styloid process of the ulna, while its base is attached to the ulnar notch of the radius. For the movements of the wrist, as I said, it is a biaxial joint, so it allows flexion, extension, adduction, and abduction. The flexion is made by the muscles of the front of the forearm, either the superficial, middle, or deep groups, except the pronator teres and pronator quadratus. So basically, it is made by the tendons of the muscles that pass in front of the wrist joint. While extension of the wrist is made by all extensors, that lie at the back of the forearm. Adduction is made by the flexor and the extensor carbi ulnaris, while abduction is made by the flexor and the extensor carbi radialis. Also, in this x ray, we can see the intercarbal joints between the surfaces of the carbal bones, the carbometacarbal joints between the bases of the metacarbal bones and the carbal bones. The metacarbophalangeal joints, these are condyloid joints between the apex of the metacarbal bones and the bases of the proximal phalanges. The interphalangeal joints, we have here the proximal and distal interphalangeal joints. So to summarize the small joints of the hand, we need to know the name of the joint its type and the movements produced there. So we have the intercarbal joints. They are plane joints, allow just gliding movement. The carbometacarbal joints, we have five of them. From the second to the fifth joints, they are plane synovial. They allow again gliding movement. While the first carbometacarbal is a saddle joint that lies at the base of the thumb. It allows flexion, extension, abduction, adduction, and opposition movement of the thumb. The intermetacarbal joints, these are plane joints between the bases of the metacarbal bones. Again, it allows gliding movement. The metacarbophalangeal joints, they are condyloid joints or biaxial joints that allows flexion, extension, abduction and adduction and finally we have the interphalangeal joints these are hinge joints that allows only flexion and extension of the phalanges this will be the end of my presentation thanks for listening if you like it please do not forget to subscribe like and share and do not forget to hit the notification bell so you can know if I upload another video Please feel free to leave a comment below. See you in the next video. Thank you.